their dog. I'm Pixie. I'm Sid. And I'm Pyrosim. The show's so great, it opens twice. It opens like 1.2 times, really. It's still well, better than only doing it once. I think this is skew a little bit. So, we're, we're just a review show. Honor. And, you know, yep. a general commentary show. Today we're talking about The Old we... Republic. I saw As Mission usual. Impossible Ghost Protocol. I played Cube, which is a new indie game called... It, it's Cube with a Q, which apparently stands for Quick, quick Understanding of Block Extrusion. It's a so we're game. spelling Cube in a whole new way. Yup. We don't care about spelling. I do. <laughs> Shut up, English major. <laughs> so yeah, we've got stuff, as always. Pyro has his uh, indie corner, as well as our recurring movie corner, because who releases games, right? Not during January, no. Who, who releases right? games after Christmas? I, th I think we're pretty much going to have to wait until Mass Effect before the Christmas shadow over gaming will lift. I'm, I'm going to look this up while we get started, so why don't we begin by talking about Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. It's got Tom Cruise in it. It's an action movie. It came also out... also features Simon Pegg. It also features Simon Pegg. And it, I thought it was pretty good. It's actually... The previous Mission Impossible movie was not so good, but this one kind of did a severe turn from that, and it's got lots of sort of subtle framing of shots and plot elements that are not explained, but are pretty obvious, but that in a more common movie, and probably in earlier movies in the series, would get a long narration explaining what they are. But they just sort of go along in this movie and are like, you're supposed to figure out what's going on and why all this action is happening. And so it's, it's double the fun, because it's like, you, you get to think and watch things explode at the same time. So the the g movie pretty much questions why are you thinking about this and just run with it? Um, no, actually, the the movie expects you to be thinking about all of the things. But, for example, and it, it's not terribly subtle, but there's this device they have that makes the perfect latex masks from the Mission Impossible series, which yeah. make you look completely like somebody else. And they mm -hmm. never say, this is a, is a device that makes latex masks. You just, it looks like a head that's got a thing that spins around, and you're just supposed to figure it out. And I was like, yeah, that, that makes sense. And so, at, at one point, the, the plan is to use masks to impersonate somebody, and then the device stops working, and they haven't told you that it's the mask-making device, but the camera is just looking at this head that's also a 3D printer, and... It, it, like, starts spraying everywhere and sparking and exploding. And if you've been paying attention, you're like, oh, well, now they won't have masks. Why does this thing explode? Because if you try to replicate Tom Cruise's head, things just explode. Well, actually, this is a rule of the real world. Makes sense. Right? Yup. So Oddly I... enough, the same thing happens when you try to replicate Gary Busey's head. <laughs> well, fact. Gary Busey, that's... Have you seen the series of horrifying photoshops that are various celebrities with Gary Busey's eyes? It's <laughs> it, it's that just regular horrible. people and like mostly attractive celebrities, except they've had their eyes replaced with Gary Busey's, <laughs> and it is terrifying. This sounds awful. It's actually I, really I'm incredible. I'm also familiar with this. And anyone can in fact replicate Mickey Rourke's with just a, a uh, can of Play-Doh. No, actually, actually, I'm wrong. The one I was thinking of with, was Steve Buscemi. It's... Okay. Pyro is currently looking these up. You may be horrified if he links these in chat. Speaking of which, we have a chat, and you guys should be a part of it here at nerdtalkshow.com. Join us, 6 p.m. Tuesdays. Central. And here's the link. But yes, there's no Steve Buscemi or Steve Buscemi's eyes in Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. And the movie is probably better for it. Like, not not that Steve Buscemi is necessarily a probably, bad actor, definitely. but his eyes are terrifying. Oh, well, hello and welcome to Cantaloupe. 
I don't get to say these things often enough, and I get to say them about once a week. Welcome to people in our chat. You're certainly welcome to be here. So, the other way in which Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol sort of sticks to action movie fundamentals is that the heroes screw up and fail almost constantly. Because a, a, a lot of the way to make a boring action movie is to make the protagonists invincible. And basically, the protagonists succeed at nothing whatsoever in this movie. Making it hard on yourselves. That's how you do it. They have... There's a series where Tom Cruise is climbing up the tallest building in the world wearing, you know, sticky magic climbing gloves. And then they fail for no particular reason. And one goes wrong, so he's, he, he's holding on by one glove to, you know, the middle of the tallest building in the world. And he has to kick his way through a window. It's very I'm suspenseful. Definitely th I'm definitely thinking the common trait in all the Mission Impossible movies is Tom Cruise will nearly fail at climbing something completely irresponsible. Yes. Like, Mission Impossible 2, it was uh, just uh, freehand rock climbing for no reason other than, eh, I had a few vacation days. Uh, Mission Impossible 3, it was a tall building that he had to scale. I believe he does the same thing in this one. Yup. So, I'm not going to say much more about Mission Impossible, but I thought it was I, really good. I, I have to ask, how was Simon Pegg's performance? Simon Pegg was great. I don't know that Simon Pegg can fail to be great. Yeah, as I understand it from what I've heard, he's pretty much just playing the same character that he played in uh, Star Trek. Um, I don't even remember what he played in Star Trek. He was Scotty. Ah, well, yep, he pretty much played Scotty. He, he's the support character who happens to be incredibly funny. He, he's nerdy, slightly awkward, slightly twitchy, but smart and useful. That's far better than if he was slightly useless and had all of those traits. So yeah, go see, go see Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. Worth oh, your money. Welcome to Q. Especially now that it's probably in the cheap theaters. And it's not in 3D. That's something to okay, commend that, it all on its that's own. That's a reason to go right there. Like, I, I can deal with not in 3D as a thing. Well, the next thing I wanted to talk about is Cube, which looks a lot like Portal. Cube. So do me a favor and spell it. Q-U-B-E. Quick understanding of block extrusion. So this is a an indie game that you no doubt downloaded through what source? Steam. Steam, of okay. course. This, this is a is game that was funded by the Indie Fund, which I initially thought was the Extra Credits Indie Fund, but it actually is just a other very similarly named Indie Fund created by uh, the people who made World of Goo and Braid, because they were like, well, we, we made successful indie games, let's pay it forward. And then they did. And Cube is That's the nice. first project to come out of that fund. And it is a first-person puzzle game that looks a lot like Portal. And insofar as everything is white, and you're stuck in a first-person perspective and you never get to see yourself, and then you're using this sort of magical device, which in this case are gloves, but they didn't really need to be gloves. They could have just as easily been a Portal gun. And they affect these colored blocks which move around depending on how you point at them with your gloves. And so, the, the game is about $15, and it's reputed to be very, very short, which I believe. I only picked it up yesterday, but I got through three of the um, nine sections of the game in about 25 minutes. So, it looks to be a pretty short game for $15, but it's actually very pretty, and it's got some pretty interesting puzzles in them, if not hard puzzles. Let's see, if, if you're watching the video after the fact, I will have edited in gameplay footage of the game right here, so you'll be like thinking, hey, that's pretty pretty. But the way it works is that the very first scene in the game, they drop you in a room, and you're like unconscious on the floor, and you just wake up, and then there's no explanation of anything. 
not even like WASD to walk around. That's what it is, but they don't tell you that. They're just like, go get him, Tiger. The game assumes that you have played Portal. Um, maybe. The game assumes that you can figure out that you need WASD, mouse to look, and left and right click. And if you can guess those things, then you can pretty much bootstrap yourself into figuring out how the game works. And so, right. a lot of the pleasure of the early part of the game comes from, well, I've been told nothing at all, and now I have to figure out the mechanics. And so, mostly the rooms are made up of white blocks, but sometimes there's red blocks, and if you left-click them, you can make them taller, and if you right-click them, you can make them shorter. So, like, the very first puzzle is you have to hop on a red block and make it very tall so that you can get onto a ledge. And then they, they do a couple of puzzles with red blocks, and then they move on to blue blocks, which are spring pads. And so they start stuck out, but then you make them shorter, and then if you step on them, they immediately become tall again, flinging you into the air. And then... There's yellow blocks, which come in pairs of three, and they always extend like a bar graph that is increasing. So there's there's one that's short, one that's medium, and one that's tall. So they look like, you know, your cell signal or something? Yeah. And so, or if you click on the middle one, then it looks like a trophy stand at the Olympics, where there's two short ones on the side and a tall one in the middle. And you have to choose which ones to click on to make it be in the formation you want so that you can get around. And then the final additional elements that I got to is they have uh, blocks that you can't interact with or anything that you can push around using the colored blocks. And so you'll have this green block that's just there. And if you try and touch it, you just walk through it. You can stand on top of it, but you can't push it around at all. And so you have to push it around using your gloves via making other colored blocks taller and shorter. And then sometimes you have to get those colored blocks into colored portals to unlock doors. And so it, the, the actual puzzle mechanic is not at all like Portal. It's, it's similar insofar as it's a first-person puzzle game, but the... Extrusion is, is very different from using portals to get around. But the puzzles are, are very fun. I liked it a lot. And, yeah. It's $15, which is maybe a little steep. Especially for a game that looks to be no more than 90 minutes long. But the puzzles are good, and it's very pretty. So, hey, if you're rolling in cash, that's another good one. All right, then. How about right. some The Old Republic talk? Alright, so I, I think we wanted to preface this with... Spoilers, spoilers, so many spoilers. If we you are want, going to spoil The Old Republic! If you want to keep your gameplay, like, whole and unmodified, totally stop listening to us. You're done for the week. That That's it. Although, I will qualify that with my opinion that spoilers for The Old Republic probably will not limit your gameplay experience too much. It's probably I, fine. I, I do really feel like playing The Old Republic, I didn't want to know what was coming next. I didn't want to know what companion was I getting next, or what, what are they like. I wanted to discover it for myself. That, that was really my thing. So whenever the general chat started discussing such things, I always just made a point to leave chat. Or to... Uh, click over to my miscellaneous window so that I wouldn't see them. Well, I guess you, the viewer, will have to make a discretionary call. But spoilers. So yeah, I, I just wanted to take uh, an episode to kind of discuss our experiences playing the different character classes and just what the stories have been like and what the experiences have been like. So uh, I, I guess I'll lead this little uh, escapade of insanity. Uh, I wanted to talk first about the Republic Trooper that I was playing uh, yesterday. And I've gotten through his starting area, and so I've gotten the basic motivation for the first part of the character's game. And I guess I should just get into it. Um, the Republic Trooper is, without a doubt, kind of the most... Uh, one, 
one aspected character in the game. I mean, the game makes it very clear right from the start, hey, you're a member of the military, and you will be throughout the entirety of your game. You are a member Don't of the stuff. Republic military, and that is all there is to you. It really makes kind of the most simple character. Um, when the game begins, you are a sergeant newly appointed to Havoc Squad, which is kind of the Republic's elite troopers. And it is your first day arriving in the battlefield, so not only do you need to meet your teammates, but you also have just gotten into this war zone, and you've already got a good reputation, but they never tell you for what. Um, upon starting the game, you're given basic missions around Ord Mantel, the same starting area as the Smuggler, and what really makes the trooper interesting story-wise is that your first day is not only to put down the Separatist Rebellion, but to locate the biggest bomb that the Republic has, which has been stolen. Oops. It was like some of all fears right out of the gate. Yeah, um, they, they say that Upon your arrival, someone lost one of the orbital bombs that are usually... Which is kind of misplaced. Yeah, that, uh... that, are, that are usually dropped from spaceships. Oops. Well, I think one of the interns might have accidentally eaten it while he was high. Look, Jimmy <laughs> lost it under the sofa, and then I think Terry picked it up and took it somewhere. I, I don't and know. then he said he loaned it to his girlfriend, but he swears she's going to get it back to us by Thursday. <laughs> right. So the the Republic Troopers story definitely plays out like an action movie from the nineties, and it's kind of awesome. I was going to say this sounds that. like a good premise. <laughs> like your your first task, the first official story mission that you're given is, hey, we've got this informant, you're going to go track him down. And, like, your CO is a Cathar and a complete jerk. This is your lieutenant at the time. Like, he rips on you because by the time you arrive at your contact, he's been killed by the Separatists. So you, you need to find his dead drop box in order to, uh to get his information. And, like, he tears into you for this, and the game gives you the option to be the good soldier or to push back against this kind of behavior. Which, I, I decided to roleplay mine like, yeah, he's a loyal soldier, he'll deal with this, it's fine. But you rapidly go from, oh, they've got one of these bombs, to, I'm going to storm the Separatist hidden volcano lair by myself, to rescue my team and get the bomb. Okay, you almost have me going there. Do you parachute into the volcano? No, you run in on foot and storm the front door. I suppose. Be cooler you if you parachute You break into down the, the front the... door with your fists. <laughs> it It's kind of epic feeling. Like, I thought I would hate the Republic Trooper that, yeah, I'm going to be doing a bunch of military missions. It's going to be like a giant Halo ripoff meets Call of Duty. Uh, no. It, the game does a great job of making you feel like this epic badass. Can you use the bomb to set off the volcano? Uh, no. I, I thought that's where it was going. I really did. I, I thought that it's going to be, I'm going to set off with a bomb and it's going to be this huge explosion and the volcano's going to detonate. It'll be great. Um, no, what ends up happening is your team, because the Republic has slighted them so many times and they feel like pushed to the side because of the Jedi, they decide to go rogue and take the bomb with them. So do you wind up so, chasing this bomb for a long time? Yeah, this ends up being the main quest of your game, to hunt down the traitorous members of Havoc Squad and reacquire the bomb. This, Which, is, this has so far failed catastrophically to be Santro the Third. Because if this were Santro the Third, you would have flown a jet down the mouth of the volcano and then exploded right. the bomb, call, causing it to blow up while wearing like, like, a fire no, the, suit. And you just I, ride I see out that on the lava. This could totally be the plot of like a, uh, a Sylvester Stallone or a Bruce Willis movie that his unit went rogue, now he's hunting them down. Like, your, your initial starting missions are to go across the galaxy and hunt down each of the five members of Havoc Squad that went evil and try to find the bomb. It's, it's just a really cool premise. Um, 
also in in standard typical fashion, the the lieutenant, your CO, uh, ends up getting demoted because of the entire debacle and becomes debacle is another fun word we don't get to use too he, often. He ends up becoming your first companion as he gets demoted to sergeant, and you get promoted to lieutenant. So he's all like, "You stole my job." Yeah, he's he's super pissed at you at the start of the game. But like, I I ran the uh, the Esselis. Esselis. It's Esselis. I ran the first Flashpoint on the Republic side, and every single time my character talked, I gained, affection, I gained affection points with this guy, because I was just being the upstanding soldier, and, and being, you know, a, a credit to the Empire. Or, not Empire, Republic, the other one. Or maybe you're, you're just so life. bad at being a Republic trooper that you're credit to Empire. Yeah, well... Part of the giant mess that Havoc Squad going rogue caused was you, you get to meet with this uh, General Garza the moment you get to Coruscant, and she informs you that, yeah, not only did Havoc Squad go rogue, thousands of other troops did. You need to fix this. By killing everyone. By, by shooting everything with my giant oversized blaster. Uh, I have to say, the Republic Trooper gets the most ridiculous weapon in the game in the form of the Assault Cannon. Like, not even the uh, the Bounty Hunter Mercenary gets such a cool gun, even though they're technically supposed to be parallel classes. So yeah, um, I'm really enjoying the Republic Trooper story. It's probably going to become one of my favorite alts. Just because it, it's so stereotypically over-the-top epic that they were like, well, we need to give people something to do so that they don't just want to play Jedi. How about we just make their uh, make their story so ridiculous you have to love them? Yeah, I, that, that is certainly a good approach. This may just be me not liking MMOs speaking, but I'm not sure I'm... As impressed with, well, I guess the other part of me that might be speaking is that I was just playing more Saints Row the Third, and I feel like, well, that's cool. It really could be cooler. That look, Saints Row the Third is just spoiling you because you're gonna ask, well, couldn't they go one step further for so every game you ever play? Only the four races that can do the trooper. Yeah, most thing, most of the classes in the game only have four options. I think there's a couple Humans exceptions to it. Humans can do everything. Zabrak can do everything. Yeah, it looks like Jedi Counselor gets five. Uh, Jedi Knight gets five. Space racism. All, Hooray! All the... And uh, Sith Inquisitor has five. It seems funny yeah. that there'd be more force-using race options than non-force-using race options. Because... You cannot be a Twi'lek... Trooper. That's weird, because there are Twi'lek Troopers. Like, there are there are Twi'lek Troopers standing in the base. In the starting area. Yeah. Just arbitrary I, I distinctly space saw a couple of player them. characters. Right? So yeah, Twi'leks, I guess, can't be Troopers. What else can't yeah, be a also, Trooper? Yeah, well, <laughs> Aw, oh, can't be a Sith Pureblood Trooper. Durr. No, because that's on the wrong who knew you, you needed? Who knew you needed eyes to shoot guns? Yep. That's a shame. Actually, the the trooper the would Twi'lek be. Twilight also can't be Sith warriors. You would that think probably the... wouldn't make sense though with that as the companion. Yeah. Why would a Twilight be serving a Twilight? Yeah. Well, why well, would humans? It, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's been known to happen. Isn't the isn't the Sith Inquisitor supposedly a former slave? Yes. So it would make sense for a Twi'lek to be that. It's like, hey, we found the slave that happens to be force sensitive. Yeah, All right, we'll take her. Not the warrior. I'm I'm really kind of disappointed that Cathar aren't one of the playable races because like their character models aren't much different from the ones that are in the game now. And the Devarodians. And the the fish people. I forget what they're called. I think the it starts with an N. No, keep going. There they are. Uh, Natalin. Those. Oh, Nautilus. Nautilus. Yeah, you'd think those would have been in there, because they're like one of the most popular Old Republic or and Clone Wars races. They look like the thing from Cloverfield. <laughs> Just not huge. 
and without deadly parasites, although they might have those. Uh, in Saints Row the Third, you could be one of those, and it would be huge, and you'd just wreck everything. <laughs> That's what I want to do. I want to see Saints Row the Third, except you're playing as Cthulhu. I wouldn't put it past them, to be honest. It's not implausible. I would like to see the Togruta. There's tons of them in-game. Yeah. In fact, you can get one as a companion if you're playing as a Jedi Counselor. Sith Inquisitor. Sith Inquisitor gets one, too. Why does everyone seem to get a Jedi? Actually, I will say one more thing about the Republic Trooper. I, I did some research into it before I made it. Um, every companion you get as the Republic Trooper is a new member of your squad. You specifically get a new member of Havoc Squad as all of your companions. So by the end of the game, it really actually feels like you have reassembled a new unit that will serve the Republic. But then, due to I think corruption that's... in the ranks, all of your soldiers are scattered to the wind and you're broken up. <laughs> you... All of your companions are like, forget And then Metroid style, you have to go reassemble them one at a time. Exactly. <laughs> Um, I did have the complaint playing as the Republic Trooper that, uh, it, it was a bit depressing that my starting armor looked like crap. I, I mean, for being heavy armor, it looks like I'm just wearing a vest. And, and that's really a shame because the Republic Trooper and their heavy gleaming armor is just so iconic. The, the Old Republic wiki says the Tukuruda are, uh, likely to be one of the playable races in the future, but it... I have no citations for that to be based on anything. Yeah, no, there, there's a ton of speculation as to what the next races will be, and as to whether you'll be able to just change your race somehow. But it, we'll, we'll see what they do. Uh, they did just add some features today, which are kind of cool. Um, they added anti-aliasing to the game, to the test servers, finally, which is kind of awesome. It's kind of a funny thing to launch without for a, you know... Hundreds of million dollar project. You gotta think how much graphic trouble they've been having up until now, so leaving that out may have been the best bet. Yeah, but the thing about anti-aliasing is that you don't have to do anything special with your assets to enable it. I mean, it's like, you sort of can just do it point blank on any model with any textures without needing any particular preparation. It's just a question of the renderer. Yeah, but I consider it kind of a problem to begin with that I haven't been able to see my character's eyes in half of the cutscenes I've gone well, through. Well, that's a fair argument. Then, then. Right. There's there's a plenty of other bugs that I could complain about that perhaps they had their priorities on. Such as not being able to sell trash items, which I was still unable to do today. There's a... I don't know how... Y I don't know how your character's having trouble with that. I have never had an issue there. Pixie can, can testify that... She saw me having trouble with it today. You were like, hey, go sell these items, and your companion was like, no, yeah, I'm whatever. keeping them. And it's very easy to prove it to somebody else who you're playing with, because your character does an animation, and even when it doesn't yeah, work, you do you a very see distinctive the animation. Mark fill up, and then there's the hand wave, go away. Yeah, the go away wave. And then your companion just keeps standing there, like, herp a derp derp. <laughs> like, what do you want? Maybe your companion just doesn't like you. Your companion's like, no. I'm currently looking at my Sith Warrior companions. We'll talk about them in a minute. So, since we're doing major spoilers on, you know, class story arcs, I think yeah, so it is hilarious. I I'm done, so why don't we talk about your, uh, your bounty hunting experience? Because that's one of the few classes I haven't tried yet. I actually don't have anything in particular to say about the bounty hunter class arc. Um, well, let's talk about the the basic storyline to begin. You are a bounty hunter. You hunt bounties. There is a contest called the Great Hunt, which you win by hunting a lot of bounties. When you do that, you meet Mandalore, who is you know super famous bounty hunter, and then he gives you some. How more is Mandalore to hunt. still alive? Um, that's a good question. Like I'm guessing Mandalore no, is. No, Mandalore is just a title. Okay, um, so it's the Mandalore chief bounty hunter. Mandalore is the hunter. name of the leader of the Mandalorians. Okay. That name gets passed on. Okay, that makes um, a lot more sense. Retroactively, you can go back and you can see this because between the Knights of the Old Republic Game 1 and Game 2, Kandra Sordo becomes the new Mandalore. Okay. Additionally... It makes a lot more sense. The reason I, 
I, I actually kind of knew what Pixie was saying There's there, but the reason I hesitated is because this particular Mandalore is incredibly old, and they sort of give indications that he's used some extraordinary means to prolong his life, but it's running out. And that makes me suspect that probably before the game is done, you're going to wind up being Mandalore as the bounty hunter. Cool. But everything I've played so far has been very straightforward. You're a bounty hunter, you hunt bounties. And I don't particularly have any problem with that. I have a pretty good attachment to my character just via the own backstory I have for them in my head. Through, you know... Head cannon. No particular. Yeah, I, merit I've been doing thing. the exact same thing. My uh, Sith warrior was horribly mauled in a space tricycle accident. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's that's not something I had in my story. That sounds pretty intense. Well, he's a cyborg. He's missing an eye. He has metal face plates all over his head, and he has no ears. Well, I, I'm a cyborg too, but I feel like I'm a cyborg just because I was like, heck yeah, I'm gonna go out and become a cyborg. There's, nope, space tricycle accident. There's a strange racism in Star Wars, and it, it shows up in a bunch of places in the Old Republic where they assume that if you're a cyborg, you are you were injured or something, that you never would ever become a cyborg deliberately. But it seems like becoming a cyborg makes you more powerful than if you weren't. And yep. so, done. But the thing I actually wanted to bring up was Pixie's Sith Inquisitor, who... In the arc we are playing at the immediate moment, which is to say earlier today, she is getting a Jedi as a companion. Actually, just a Padawan, but, you know, mm -hmm. a light side Jedi who has light side training for a very evil character who behaves to be evilly. Honest, to, 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 to be frank, though, one, she doesn't know that yet, and I haven't technically acquired her yet, so there could be other things that we haven't seen yet. Two... I'm tempting her to the dark side. Yeah, I'm doing the exact same thing. Um, the it's Sith. Like, you want to look at this forbidden knowledge? The Sith warrior is one of those it's weird classes. Cool. Uh, I I kind of wanted to talk about this when we got to the Sith warrior, but I guess we can bring it up now. Um, the Sith warrior's third companion, uh, Jason Wilson, is actually two different characters. Uh, if you are playing as a light side character so light side tier one or above when you uh hit the end of your act one you will get the light side version of uh, uh jasa and it will actually change your story to where you are trying to reform the sith empire if you are dark side tier one or below when you hit the end of Act 1, you will actually receive Dark Side Jasa Wilson, who is, or who will act like a completely different character, have different likes and dislikes, different gift giving. Um, she keeps the same crew skills, but she effectively changes personality and uh, how you gain affection points with her. And she's actually not a romanceable option if you are playing as a light side character because she will still be considering herself a celibate Jedi. Kind of weird, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I like that the story is that in-depth that depending on how you play, you will gain a different companion and she will act differently. But, uh, I don't know, it, it's a little frustrating that once again I feel like I couldn't have played a neutral character because that that wouldn't have led anything. I'm actually really not sure what would happen with Jaysa if you are playing neutral. That said, the scene that leads up to you acquiring Jaysa is one of my favorite scenes I've ever seen in a video game. It's this big epic duel with Jaysa's master where he goes completely insane during it. Like, that was awesome. That, that was grand cinematic gold. I highly recommend for anyone who wants to see, like, a Jedi going fully to the dark side that you check out the Sith Warrior's story from either side. Alright, so I guess, uh, Pixie, why don't you talk about some of your favorite moments on uh, either of your main characters? I, well, I have one main. My uh, Sith Inquisitor's level 35 now. And then I've got a few alts. Um, I've, I've played 
couple of the classes that you haven't touched yet, the Inquisitor and the Republic Side Smuggler. Yep, those are the other two classes I have not actually dived into at all. I'm a little bit frustrated with my smuggler right now because I feel like I'm either undergeared or something for this area I'm in right now because it's become all of a sudden much harder than I feel like it has been previously. Have you been taking only commendations? Um, yes, and I've been modifying the gear that I have worn slots for, which is a couple things. Hmm. Interesting. What level is your smuggler now? 20-something? 20 23, maybe? Okay, so you are on the Tatooine. Republic version of... Oh, you've already moved to Tatooine. Maybe you have to go back and do some bonus series on a previous planet. I haven't, like, dropped any quests with her. N done all the flashpoints? I haven't done any flashpoints with her. Uh, heroics. I've done the heroics where I've been able to find them. Hmm. Odd. Maybe you just have to level up before going back to whatever you're doing. Is it a I class? I mean, they're yellow. Is it a class quest that you're on? Yeah, so I have noticed that sometimes the class quests end up being harder than the normal world quests. So it's best to put those off for a while while you just do planet stuff. I don't want to do the interesting stuff. Yeah, I know. You don't want to repeat the, the planet stuff again. And therein lies my main dissatisfaction with MMOs. I, I feel like yep. the good stuff is dripped in at a tiny, tiny rate compared to the grind. It's like... Uh, dialogue trees and good writing are extremely compelling to me, but that happens mm -hmm. sort of, you know, one hour in 50. And the other 49 hours are kind of like MMO gameplay. Which I guess if you're Clear? into MMO gameplay, sure. Yeah, but you haven't had it as bad as it has been. Like, I, I will compliment the Old Republic in that there is no point in the game whatsoever where you have to grind. Just stand out in a field and kill a couple hundred of these enemies, not for a quest, but just because I need the experience to get to the next level so that I can go do better stuff. Well, at no point have I re been required to do that in the Old Republic. But if you look back at, like, look back at EverQuest, um, Guild Wars... Even even World of Warcraft, there were times in those games back before they were made easier, before the level caps were dropped or before experience was changed, where your only option, if you want to get better, is to murder a couple hundred of these things and do nothing else. The bonus quests kind of ameliorate that in name only, because they're like, bonus quests tend to require you to stick in an area after you've completed the objectives and kill some extra mobs and in you, in usually very rare yeah i cases, usually finish the bonuses story on the associated mission. with that but in the vastly more common case it's just kill these mobs and you'll get more experience why I, who knows it just happens i found that for the most part you end up killing the it's like well we're already killing these things for some other quest anyway yeah, no, the the bonuses for me, I've or always managed to clear these are just in my them. way on the way to some other quest, so may as well type of thing. Yeah, I've never had a problem clearing the bonus quests while still just doing the normal work. Mm. That That's never been an issue for me. Well, yeah. one go. thing that I would frequently do, given my druthers, is I would mm. fight l fewer fights than... I do, because yeah. it is possible oh, to, you try to dodge fights. use aggro radiuses and just get to your objective, get in, get out, get going, as the motto of, I'm sure that's something, that's got to be a car commercial, but I, I would totally do that, and I played a rogue on the old Republic, or on World of Warcraft, Spect Subtlety, pretty much for that reason, because... You know what, I have... I, I've done basically the same thing on my smuggler. On Nar Shaddaa, there was one quest. This is hilarious. There was one quest where I had to, like, break into this, you know, area or whatever. And, you know, get I, I had to get to this particular computer terminal and report once I got inside so they could send some dudes or whatever. And I turned on and manipulated the aggro radius such that I didn't get into a single fight while I was in there. Hardcore. And then by the time I logged into the, the terminal, he was like, Oh, man, 
that you had to fight through so many dudes, or, like, he commented on, like, all those people I killed or whatever. It's like, dude, I didn't touch anybody! <laughs> the no, game just assumed escaped me. that I had to fight my way through, but because I played a smuggler that took the scoundrel spec and has stealth, I was just like, stealth, get in no fights, just get to my objective. Yep. And And I deeply enjoy playing that way. Which is why I, I played an infiltrator in Mass Effect, but I feel like the game definitely punishes you for that because it's much quicker than if you fight through all the mobs, and they're motivated to keep you playing for as long as possible so you keep subscribing. But all of the fights are very similar to each other. So if you go through the front door and you kill every group of enemies that comes within your vision, then yes, the bonus quests are completed sort of by default. But if you're sort of goal-oriented, and you just want to get done the things that are actually supposed to be done according to the conversations, then you don't kill enough mobs. And so, that's... it, it feels a little grindy to me. A, a, a few other complaints that I want to mention is that the pops are kind of really fast somewhere, or many times, Yeah. and there will be new monsters spawning right on top of you, even if you're standing right where they spawn. I, I would feel really good. I had that happen. I've had that happen like 10, 15 times. I had that happen today. Remember, uh, Pyro, you, well, you and I, I think we had died somewhere, was what had happened. That we walked around or whatever, and I'm standing here, and I'm healing myself or whatever after that big fight. And then all of a sudden, some monster or whatever spawns right on top of where I am standing, and I just go, oh crap, and I just start running, and thankfully it hadn't, like, noticed that I was standing inside of it. Yep. I, I pulled up a picture of the Cathar lieutenant who joins the the trooper as the first companion, who is also romanceable if you happen to be playing a female trooper. He, he has a permanent scowl. I don't know if that's a normal Cathar trait, but this guy always looks like he's about to bite someone's head off. Uh, I think most of them look like that. Righto. The, he's a kitty person. So the story you detailed about the... maybe he's just sick the, of being called a kitty. The story you Sorry, detailed about the monster spawns is not nearly so bad as the one that you and I encountered a few days ago, which is that we were fighting through some dungeon... And there was an elite mob, so we were like, let's kill that, and then we killed it. And then, since it was dead, oh. there was a knock on the door, or something like that, and you had to leave your computer. So you're like, well, there's no, there's no enemies around us, I'm gonna go answer the door real quick. And then, for like two minutes, that elite mob spawned every 15 seconds. And I'm not exaggerating how quickly it spawned. Every 15 seconds, and immediately aggroed on you. And I had to, I had to pull it off and kill, and kill it. So I fought that one elite like 40 times, Four times. while you were answering the door. So I, and then I came back and I was all like, "Oh, did we get in a fight?" And you're all like, "We're dead." Face palm. We no, actually, actually survived. He stayed alive. Just fine. <laughs> now, 15 seconds is just long enough to cast your channeled heal, which fully restores your energy, or in my case, heat and health. And so I was in right, tip-top shape to fight him every single time. But we got a lot of experience that way, too. But my complaint in that case is that I would like to see a feature added wherein your presence in a aggro radius of a mob spawner would delay that mob spawner. It, it would. However, I would imagine in higher population servers that would become a problem where everybody's waiting for something to spawn. Yeah, no, I know the respawn timer is specifically keyed to uh, to how many people are in a given area at a time. Mm -hmm. And that if there's so many people, it will respawn faster. Or even... Except there were only two of us. Just have True. multiple spawn nodes, and if there's people standing in one, spawn it in the other. And if there's people standing in both, you know, so be it. But I don't think that that would be the common case by any means. And not nearly so common as we've encountered it in our playing. Right who? Let's see. There was... Corso, I hate you and your stupid dreads. <laughs> I'm looking through the list of characters trying to find out who gets the, uh, the Jawa companion. 
What class did I play during testing? I think it was a Jedi Knight. And I, Jedi I Knight. played that up to, like, level 12. Uh, there was the end of the first planet class quest arc. Went in a sort of strange way while we're, you know, covering how the class quests work. Is there was this dark side dude who I had been chasing down for, you know, levels 1 to 10. And he was like, hey, don't kill me. You've caught me. Please don't kill me. And then I was like, okay, I won't kill you because I was like, I'm going to take you back to the Jedi Council and then they can deal with you. But then yep. the all my only dialogue options from that point all spiraled out of control such that I was like, yes, I want an alliance with you and I want to use your dark side powers for my benefit. And then I had T9, my companion droid, with me. T7. Or T7. And so I was like, well, since I've no, automatically, and I couldn't sort of get away from it once I'd make, made this dialogue choice to not kill him. I memory wiped my companion so that T7 wouldn't know that I had allied with the dark side. And I was like, wow, this sort of got way out of my hands. This is not at all what I intended to do. I, I've actually totally got some commentary on the same line. Um, I recently had to restart my Sith Warrior character. Pyre, I don't know if you heard this at all. I don't think I have. I don't know if... I don't think Pix has told you. Okay, so from launch, I had been attempting to play a light side Sith Warrior. For, for which I had given him colossal amounts of crap. So, I, I was playing the character in the mind that, okay, he's not a mindless brute, he does have a conscience, he is using the dark side as a tool to gain power, but he's not a monster. And in, in story, that's kind of pretty justifiable, because the Empire's policy is that any Force-sensitive person in Imperial Domain that is, you know, found out to be Force-sensitive is then mandatorily engaged, enrolled in Sith training. So, yeah, it, you could just be a nice guy, and you're just, like, walking around, and then they're like, hey, yeah, you're sensitive, and they kidnap you and take you to the Sith Academy. I, I was playing a sarcastic flirt who would do what he could to help the Empire, but wasn't a maniac. I thought that was kind of a cool character. Yeah. My problem with that came in towards the end of Act 1, where I was being forced by the game that no matter what, I was doing horribly evil things. So, like... Welcome uh, to the Empire. At my first class quest on Balmora was, hey, Darth Barris has this agent. His cover might be potentially blown. You need to go kill him before it is. And I was assuming that I, there's going to be a way that I can reassign him, that I can just say, hey, get out of here, go, retreat, or fake his death somehow. Nope. You end up getting into this really cool duel where at the end of it, you have to kill him. You know, he's like, we need to make this look real for the security cameras. I won't hold back. Of course, he killed me once, which I thought was funny. It's like, Darth Barris is going to be so mad. Um, and then later, I got reassigned that, oh, we need to track down this Jedi Padawan. You're going to go to Tatooine find her master that she trained with there, and kill him. I was pleased when the game gave me the option that, no, I'm not. I'm going to follow the path of the Padawan doing the, the things that she did in her manner. Like, I had the choice to kill what was called a sand demon. I didn't. I used her methods and peacefully gained what I needed from it, the same way that she did. Um, then I went and found the master, and his, his apprentice was like, Ah, I'm going to kill you to protect the master! And I just knocked him out. In fact, he ended up memory wiping the guy. And then I was like, I have the information I need. Your Padawan told me. I'm going to leave now. Bye! And, like, I got to leave with light side points, and the, the master had to deal with the fact that he just mind wiped his own apprentice. A horribly evil action. Well, this, this, so, like, I got to walk away feeling smug and happy on that one. The Old Republic is actually, like, incredibly callous towards uh, mind wipes and mind tricks. They're like, yeah, you, you know, just crawl in somebody's mind and make them do things that they didn't want to do. I, it's it's oh, no. pretty regular. The game, like, has no qualms about that. No, it really does, because when I did it on my Sith Warrior, it 
it made it clear that my character knew just how evil this master had just been by doing that. Like, the, the point of the Sith Warrior's quest is essentially deception. No one is how they really appear to be to the Sith Warrior. Like, my master is horribly evil and faking out the entire galaxy. Um, this Padawan's master used to be dark side and has pretending has been pretending to be light all of these years. These Jedi masters have been doing horribly evil things around me. That that's the point of the warrior's story, that no one is how they really appear to be. I mean, even me playing a light side Sith, I'm hiding what I am for the empire. Uh and there was also a I I'm stuck in this class part with my smuggler right now where I run into I've got a fight against two elites. Some crime boss and a Sith. Mm -hmm. And in the cutscene immediately beforehand, she tries. She's tr been trying to make me t side with her and against this Jedi who's been chasing her the entire planet long. And so, you know, I was all like, "No, nah, it's I, I have no problem with the Jedi. I'm, I'm being paid to do this. Forget you." And so finally, we have this big confrontation. She's all like, "You want to draw your weapon and attack the Jedi?" And I'm like, "I want to laugh at how silly you are because that didn't work on my character." Yep. But she turns to Corso, my companion, who I had it, who who was the romance option for my character, and goes, "You want to draw your weapon and kill your captain?" At which point, he's like, "I want to kill you, captain." And I'm like, the "Hell, dude!" <laughs> you fail. Clearly, he's not the super special force resistant snowflake you thought he was. Maybe you should find a better romance option. So, what should obviously I hear the Wookiee is this kiss as well is then competitive mind tricking, where you're both just crawling in Corso's mind and just manipulating the hell out of him. This is the point where well, your captain this is, my has to, this is the point where your captain just has to flash Corso. <laughs> ah, That's, oh, I don't want to shoot you. <laughs> right, you don't. So the captain has no way of doing any force manipulation stuff. Right, right. I, I got distracted for a moment and thought it was your Inquisitor. No. no. Um, it's not Andy. Andy but even care. continuing the Sith warrior problems, so I, I was very happy up until this point. You know, I would found a way to peacefully resolve most of the situations. My character has the moral high ground in most situations, which I liked. You know, playing a light side character, you, you want to have that moral high ground. Showing just how evil the galaxy is. I, I managed to do this until I got to um, Alderaan. Which, I love the fact that throughout Alderaan, they're doing nothing but making jokes about blowing up the planet. Like, three-fourths of the NPCs on Alderaan are just joking about, I'll oh, see this planet destroyed before it falls into the hands of the Sith. Yes, you will. Have fun with that. Um, but, on Alderaan, my job was to track down Jace's parents and they assumed to kill them. So I storm around the countryside. I got to lead this, like, really great last-ditch effort to protect a fort of Republic troops um, from being overrun by uh, this evil third-party house. And that was awesome. Like, I got to give the big military speech about holding your ground and got to scold the, uh, the person who was like, I won't fight with the Sith. You'll fight with me. You'll fight with me, or they'll shoot you. I'm not going to touch you. That was enjoyable. Mm -hmm. But then I reach the end of the quest line, and of course, there's a Jedi standing in Castle Organa, which I had just finished storming. I climb to the highest tower, and there's a Jedi standing with Jace's parents, and like. I, I'm pretty much just ignoring the Jedi every time he speaks. It's giving me the option every time the Jedi talks that, oh, attack the cocky Jedi. Attack the Jedi. Kill the Jedi. Seriously, aren't you sick of the Jedi taunting you? And, like, every time I'm just brushing him off and I'm like, I'm, I'm talking to the parents. Can you wait? Like, your lightsaber hum is annoying me. Please turn it off. And I think I'm doing the good option by encouraging Jace's parents to come to the Empire... You know, they're, they're servants in the Organa's castle. They're going to be for the rest of their lives. I'm like, hey, come to the Empire. You can live in my house. I'm never there. I assumed I was being nice, right? Mm. So I end up forced into fighting the Jedi. There, there's no way to avoid it. He's like, if you're going to take them, then I'll just kill them. Like, dude. That's not... Way to go dark. Like, I, again, that's the point of the Sith Warriors storyline, that, like, when pushed to it, anyone can be dark. 
Which you. you'd think would be the best setup for being a light side Sith warrior. Mm -hmm. Showing that not everyone is as they appear. And that going along with this idea for your character. I thought this was good writing up until this point. Then, after I finish off the Jedi and send off Jace's parents, I get a communication from Darth Barris, my lord, who's like, great idea, sending them to the Empire. Her, her, I'm going to intercept and torture them. And my two options for conversations were, ha, that was just as I planned, dark side points, or, oh, I didn't think about it that way, dark side points. Yeah. I, I, I didn't have the option to say, no, they're my servants, leave them alone. The, the game has quite a few points like that, and they're particularly jarring and I, when... I, I feel like... I I even got an in-game mail from Jace's parents that said, like, We've arrived on uh, Drum and Koss. It's rather lovely here. We're getting used to the constant lightning storms, and my wife's finally stopped shaking at the idea of joining the Empire. By the way, this Darth Barris guy contacted us. We're going to go see him tomorrow. Hope it all goes well. Dot, dot, dot. That, I, I expect the letter it's to like, just be oh, like, oh. oh, yeah, we got here, and it's a nice planet and everything, and oh, God, ah, oh, the lightning, oh, it burns. I'm Make surprised it, it didn't include, like, their teeth. But no, it included a couple hundred credits, which I thought was funny. That these poor penniless servants who I'd sent to go work in the Empire in my house would send me money. <laughs> In exchange like, okay, for you sending this made them to, no you know, sense. torture and probably murder. Yeah, by the way, I killed your daughter's master, and she's currently living on my ship. Her, her, her. So, yeah. I, I started getting ridiculously ticked off at the writing at that point, to the degree that I went back and re-rolled a Dark Side Sith Warrior. Just because at least then I'll have some consistency in the game. Faults of this category are particularly problematic if me, if you're like me, and you're thinking, well, I pretty much hate the gameplay, but I want to... I'm, I'm sort of into my character, so I want to, you know, hang out with my character yeah. a little bit more. I, I was super into my character, but I really hate the fact that it's... It's essentially the Sith Warrior storyline forces you to be dark, even though it was so intriguing and had such a great plot being a light side. Like, I really loved where it was going. I'm like, cool, so the theme is that things aren't always as they appear. That includes my character. I really like that. That's well written. W wait a minute. W why am I being forced to be evil here? What? Where's my other option? There's actually a sort of opposite version of that on Taurus, which Pixie and I are playing right now. And that is that there's this sort of jerk antagonist character who's following you around and sabotaging all of your missions... And, and trying to get you killed repeatedly. And you have no you have option to just you? attack her. No. Ever. She's a Sith apprentice. Mm. And I'm a lord of the Sith! Like, there's a lord title over my character's head. What? And, and, and yet this entire time, where she's all like, Nyeh, nyeh, I'm so much better than you, and I'm, you know, I'm gonna kill you, da, da, da. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, you can't beat me. Why can't I just go, shut up, you're a failed apprentice, I'm a dark lord of the Sith, I've killed Darths! You should shut up! And when you first meet the antagonist, she's an apprentice under the protection of a Dark Lord, so it's like, okay, maybe you don't want to kill her because you don't want to upset her master. But then, like, two missions in, her master disavows her, and then she just keeps going around ruining all of your missions. And then she's just standing in front of you, she's like, hi, we're hanging out, and you can't, you can't shoot her, even though you have a blaster. And it's like, why am I playing this game? Because I want to shoot her, but I can't. Sometimes there are just social situations where you can't unload a blaster. I don't know that there are when you're my not level. Not in the Sith Empire! Not, yeah, not when you're a Sith, or at the Lord level of being a Sith. Because, I mean, I did totally just watch a Darth choke the planetary governor to death in his own facility. There's actually a, a sequence on Alderaan where you're... The bounty hunter character is hired to do diplomacy. And, and you can, like, try to do diplomacy, but you're not very good at it. Or you can just, you know, pummel the people Jesus. until they relent. And pummeling people until they relent works pretty well for that diplomacy. And, and so he's, like, running around and I'm following him. And he just is punching all these, like, politicians in the face. <laughs> hey, vote for me! <laughs> No, it's like, you want to cooperate with this house? 
punch. Give me the secret coded message. And they're like, no, and then you're like, punch, and they're like, fine. <laughs> Ow. All it takes is one punch and you'll get any information you want. Especially when you're wearing, you know, metal bracers and all that. Also, you have, like, jetpacks on your gloves, so you can be like, jet punch. (laughs) I will accelerate my fist. Also, flamethrowers. Flamethrowers are important. Flamethrowers are cool. So, yeah, um, I guess we've hit our hour, so is there any more we want to say? I actually had one other game I was playing this week that I wanted to mention just in passing. And that is okay. Saria, which is very much the hair to knit and knit stories. And those are both excellent free games by Niflis. And they're sort of very ambient exploration games where you just sort of walk around and, you know, climb walls and find power ups that let you jump to let you get into new areas and you can explore some more. Pretty much the core gameplay mechanic of both of Knit and Knit Stories are exploration. And they have beautiful visuals and great music, and I love them for that. And Saria is very much the same, except it's not free, but it also has puzzles in it. Like, much more thought-intensive puzzles. And the image on Steam for it is sort of deceptive when you're looking at it in your games library, because I got it as sort of some package deal. So I had it in my library, but I had never looked at it specifically. And then the image that shows in your Steam library when you select it is one of ping pong. Because there's, you have a spaceship and sometimes when you're flying between planets, you you can play some ping pong. But I was like, why do I want to play this ping pong game? It turns out that that's not any of it. So, ambient exploration, good music, uh, puzzles. Alright then. Uh, unfortunately we don't have much League of Legends news this week, uh, simply because we haven't seen anything about new champs, but we do have a new holiday, which is kind of spiffy. Uh, so they, they're having the Lunar Revel, which is the League of Legends equivalent to Chinese New Year. And with it, we got four new skins, which are all kind of cool. So there's a new Talon, Wukong, Sona, and Lee Sin skin. Um, I'll definitely say I think the winner out of the group is the Lee Sin, who basically it's a Hollywood Bruce Lee skin. Um, Lee Sin being the blind monk, he's actually wearing uh, blind sunglasses. Uh, He's got just a, a... dragon tribal tattooed white shirt on and basic pants it, it's pretty entertaining uh if nothing else my biggest recommendation is check out the splash screen the login screen because they've done a a new version of the league of legends theme song which just sounds absolutely beautiful highly recommend checking it out but yeah still no new news for a new champion yet Kind of weird. When you said there was a new holiday and it was Lunar Revel, I was hoping you were going to follow that up and with, and there's a new holiday map. It's on the moon. And then Summoner's that Rift on the moon. That would be super sweet. Be pretty um, hardcore. No, we, we haven't had any more updates to the map yet. I think we're still on the winter map, actually. They cycle in between the winter map and the regular map randomly at the moment. Yep. Mm-hmm. I really think we need... The the big thing that Summer's Rift needs at this point is just more random maps. Or a selectable version of it, since it doesn't affect at all how the game plays. Right, they're, they're just it's just skins. a cosmetic thing for you. Except for the yeah, fact I, that the turret uh, range lines in the middle are not visible on the winter map. Mm-hmm. But, yes, I think cosmetic maps would be cool to have. Yeah. I, I would actually really love to be able to just pick which map I want to use for each game. I would I would like to have a steampunk version of it where the water is like green and toxic looking and there's uh, pipes with steam coming out of them just scattered around the map. How could that we apply this cool. to free to play? Because we need to make it so people are buying these map skins obviously. But Same. Charge for them. Yeah, but then there's five people to ten people in a game and maybe, maybe one of them has bought it and nine yeah, so have not. Basically you have to own the map in order to to see it. The other people won't be able to see it. It's just a you thing. 
That's why you would only charge as much as a basic skin for them. But uh, I don't see why you couldn't do that. Yeah, sounds good to me. All right, this, this is a recommendation that should go on the Riot forums. Because I highly doubt anyone from Riot is listening to Nerd Talk. Or let's just go to Riot and punch in their front door and then change it ourselves. See, now we're learning from our old Republic characters. Where's my lightsaber? You're right. I, sh- I should have been more safe throw about that. Okay, we'll have to crash a VTOL jet into Riot Headquarters, and then zombies. If we're going Saints Row 2, we would just steal a septic truck and spray the front of their houses with it. No, no, that, that's Saints Row 2. That, that's yeah, the we're going Saints Row 3, now we're crashing jets Before you jets could jump into, into cars from 20 feet away almost instantaneously. Yep, and no less correct yourself so that you are sitting in the seat properly and drive off. All right, then. So I guess that'll do it for this fine Tuesday, January 10th, 2012. You're going to have to get used to saying that. 12. Didn't mess it up this time. In fact, got the date right and everything. Improvements. Less drinking before the show, you know. We should correct that. I should be drinking more before the show? I mean, we can correct that now is what I mean. Possible. Anyway. I think you've got some alcoholic whipped cream around somewhere. Uh, f- for this week's episode of Nerd Talk, I'm Pixie. I'm Sam. And I'm Pyrosim. And you've been listening to Nerd Talk. We think. Catch you next time.